Hey everyone, welcome to ABCs of Anesthesia. Um, so today we're going to continue on from our interview podcast and video series. And today we have um, Elle, who's kindly agreed to come on and be a bit of a guinea pig, I guess. So um, do a bit of live interview practice with us and um, get some feedback. Um, so I think I just want to say, um, I remember being in your position and I think having the courage to kind of do this is, um, is a great testament to your character. I th you know, I think it's a really useful chance for you to get feedback and it's really mm -hmm. confronting to do it in front of, uh, you know, lots of people. Um, so yeah, good on you. And hopefully you do find today really helpful and hopefully everyone else applying can see how amazing you are and uh, see where the bar is. <laughs> hey, so Elle, um, tell us a bit about yourself, where you're at in, in your training. Sure. So I'm, so my name's Elle, I'm PGY4. I'm actually an ICU trainee at the moment. So I was an ICU reg last year. And then this year I'm doing an anesthetic PHO job in Queensland. I'm trying so hard to learn how to stare at the camera and not my screen. <laughs> like a skill I have to learn. Um, so that's where I'm at at the moment with my training. You're definitely doing better than me. I, I cannot do the whole look at the camera thing still. So yeah. You have to print out some pictures of eyeballs and stick them there. Yeah, that's, a, that's a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe I should do that. Hey, so why don't we kick off? Let's go with the first question. Um, Elle, tell us, a bit of, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay. Um, so, like I said before, my name is Elle. I am a PGY4 ICU trainee and registrar and currently work in the capacity of an anaesthetic PHO. Um, I'm a very uh, enthusiastic and passionate about the practice of anesthesia as well as intensive care medicine. And in particular, I also have a real passion for rural medicine, which has really driven most of my um, work and uh, in medicine to begin with and what I hope to do in the future. Excellent. Um, what, are, what are some things that keep you balanced outside of work? So I think there's so... There's so many things that can keep your life rich and well balanced outside of work. And I think like many people, for me, that primarily revolves around maintaining my connections with my family, my friends and my loved ones. Uh, this can be as simple as just having cups of tea, catching up for coffee. Um, but outside of those connections with the people that I love, um, I spend a lot of time in the ocean. So I'm a very keen surfer, free diver um, and I do a bit of spear fishing. So when I do get the time, those are things that I love to do. Um, and I really look, something I can look forward to when it's been a really busy um, month or a week at work. Excellent. Hey, so with that question, how, how do you feel when you get asked such a broad question? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> you've got to try and sell yourself. Like I'm just, <laughs> I think most doc, I, I have a feeling most doctors aren't like, I'm awesome. It just doesn't come naturally and yeah. I don't know how to and I also I'm trying to sound interesting without sounding boring because I feel like most of my life is work at the moment but it, I love my job yeah um and trying to make yourself sound like a normal human as well yeah. is yeah a challenge and I think your answer was pretty well balanced like I would actually the fact that you do things as interesting as free diving uh I'd definitely just chuck that in there because uh, let's say, imagine an interview for a day that's ra roughly around 20 people um, and everyone's going to sound very similar. And if you just have that to anchor people's memories of you, uh, definitely surfing, free diving, anything a little bit like that, it's very different to being passionate about anesthetic trick care, which everyone else is going to say. So having a point of difference like that, I think is really good. Uh, and personally, I think your answer is great. I would actually almost um, lead straight off from your clinical stuff. I'm really passionate about this, this, and this. I really love rural, rural medicine. And, you know, outside of work, I try to keep balanced. And I, you know, really, really into anything to do with the ocean, free diving, surfing. Um, this keeps me very grounded. I like that a lot of the stuff you said was just simple stuff, because I think acknowledging that simple things are really, really useful. I mean, if you don't have coffee or tea with your friends, then, you know, that, 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 that's, that, that's just connection. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think I agree with everything Lars said. Um, I think generally for this, uh, what they really want to know, it's a, it's a bit of an icebreaker question. Okay. So, you, so you don't have to go too hard on the selling. Um, and they just kind of, it's, it's a way to get you to calm down. Um, and like Lahiri said, the way I kind of structure this is you go clinical, professional, personal. You did clinical and personal. And I think that's, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I think you probably had a bit more time to flesh out some of the professional stuff if you wanted to. Um, but I, I agree. Like, I think you are way more interesting than I was when I was a quick care resident. Um, and I think you should definitely mention the spearfishing and all that extracurricular stuff because 
um, you know, everyone's very, very similar and homogenous and that stuff makes you stand out. Um, and it can lead very organically into kind of um, developing rapport um, with the consultant. So that's really good. Can I just ask, so that what would the difference between being a clinical and professional things about myself? Yeah, so I um, so I broke this into clinical, kind of being purely what you do clinically, so at work. So that's kind of, um, so you know, you're, ICU, you're doing ICU, you're interested in anesthetics and what position you're doing and what your aspiration and interests are. Um, professional, I think of kind of research, teaching, oh. kind of medicine, but not clinical side of yep. things. Okay. Um, it, it's just a way that I, I split it up. I think Lahiru just had clinical, which included all that stuff and personal, um, which is fine. It's however way your mind works, really. Okay. Um, for all the other questions, you may get get a sense of how long do I talk for? And I found that in our interviews of people, they they all have the sense of not sure how long to talk for. So roughly 15 and 20 minutes per interview. Imagine four to five questions, roughly four minutes. And it's always worthwhile, say, you know, giving a, a broad list of things and saying, oh, I'd love to go into more detail about this. Yeah. And then they can always stop you at that time. It's very hard to gauge how much they want. And even the panel members will be wondering between each other, oh, do we need to slow down? Should we ask more questions? There's also that uncertainty within a panel about how much they can probe into, into your answers as well. So feel free to, you know, you, you, yeah, you can frame it in a way that uh, allows you to talk more if, if prompted or you can you know, prompt yourself in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, go for it, Cass, next question. All right. So next question, L. Um, so obviously we have a lot of candidates applying for this job and we've been interviewing about 40 people. Why mm -hmm. do you think we should pick you? I think you should pick me for the job for several reasons. First would be my previous experience uh, and demonstrated commitment to anesthesia, both professionally and in terms of my research. And secondly, I think I bring something unique in terms of my commitment to rural medicine, um, which again, I've demonstrated in the past. I'm happy to go into each one of those things if you'd like me to. So in terms of my demonstrated commitment to anesthesia, as I mentioned before, I'm currently an anesthetic PHO. And I think that my enthusiasm and passion for this job has definitely been demonstrated in the department that I work in because I've been nominated for Best and Fairest Registrar, which I think has been a wonderful honour to have and certainly I hope reflects my enthusiasm. I've actually gone on and done my Masters of Medicine in Critical Care just because I have such an interest in this area. And I've also gone and done research relating specifically to regional anaesthesia, in fact, I presented a poster at an ANSCA conference just a couple of weeks ago and was awarded best poster presentation. I think one thing that certainly probably makes me unique compared to other candidates is that I have a demonstrated commitment to rural medicine. I spent actually the first three years of my medical career so far working in a regional under-resourced setting certainly incredibly challenging but also really rewarding and has just motivated me to continue to my commitment to rural medicine and certainly I hope that a career in anesthesia means that I can bring um, the specialty of anesthesia to other more regional rural parts of Australia. Great how do you think that went? I think it went okay um, I'm just trying not to repeat myself from previous questions and um, I think it's hard because I actually one of the bosses at work ran past that same question past me. And he said, you do realize Elle, everyone's gonna say that they're good at teamwork and they're good at communicating. And I was like, damn it, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how do I make myself sound like remotely different? Cause everyone's such a high caliber. And I know the one thing that does make me a bit different is that I've done a lot of rural medicine and it is something I'm interested in. So it's something that at least makes me a little bit different. Yeah. Um, and trying to like quickly, for me, that was like a, I don't know if it's correct, but that was a quick prompt for like, show me your highlights on your CV. So I was just like, boom, 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 boom. Hmm. Essentially. So um, this is a variation of um, what uh, we call the, the brand question, right? So kind of what, what's your brand? What's your sell? Why should we pick you? Um, and I actually think you did really well to stand out. I think your, your answers were quite unique and you were really good at identifying really impressive things that you'd done in, a, in quite an organic and humble way. Um, that's actually tricky to do because you had some really impressive um, achievements that I think you did that really well. That's that's very challenging sometimes. Um, 
I think in terms of length, it was kind of a good length. And I think, um, so I, th I think those two points are great. I, I really, really don't have any comments. I think you developed them well. I think you used examples really well. What I would kind of say to the comment about not using stuff like communication and leadership, everyone does say it, but um, it really depends on how you sell it and what your examples are. So if you say, look, I work great in leadership. Um, and an example of when I exemplified this was, um, you know, you can have a really good example from when you like let a, let a code or something or when you're a leader of like a small committee and you had something really interesting. And it's really about your ability to identify the salient complexities in that situation and then um, show how you work through them and then how you learn from them and reflect them. That's really what, what sells you. Mm -hmm. So if everyone goes, oh, I'm a great communicator, um, you know, um, and everyone tells me I'm a great communicator, that's really boring and that's really repetitive. But if you can then back that up with a really substantive um, experience, which, which but sounds like you have lots of great experiences that are really interesting, I think that would work very well. Um, what, what do you think, Lau? Yes, Al, my, my feedback for that is I actually think that was a really genuine and very, very good answer, mainly because, um, uh, so the, fir the first point I'd say is you had lots of facts. Um, you had facts that were very unique to you, very, you know, re really hit, hit home and they were exceptional facts. They were, you know, award, award things, they were, you know, they were prizes, they showed a lot of dedication and work. Uh, so they weren't just words. So I think that's a very useful thing. But every, in the second thing is every interview panel will score you differently. For example, some interview panels might score your CV, score your references, and then score the interview and whatever other criteria. Uh, other interview panels will come together and just do do uh, score you from a clean slate, so they won't cover your CV and your references, and they'll start scoring you from this interview. And the fact that you're able to you know bring these really concrete examples from the interview feel feels really good. So uh, I think that was a, that was a very good point. Another learning point for everyone else listening, I think your ability to tell a story of you is actually quite good. Uh, so. If someone is saying that they just did this and this, it doesn't seem to hit hit home as well as I've got a story about what I do. I've spent this much time in rural. I'm really committed to that. And all of these things are part of that story of me being an anesthetist in the rural setting. So I think I, th I think that all works very well to your favor. So yeah, I'd say just 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 keep doing. And you did something good, which was listed it and then you're about to give the example. So listing and then I'll, you know, I will say more if you'd like me to. Great. Sounds like you do, and, and I'll go ahead and elaborate. And so I thought, thought that was a really useful uh, technique on that on that on that count. Now um, I might just ask you an impromptu question. So let's say you don't get into anesthetic training. Where where, where would your path lead? Sure. Um, if I don't get into anesthetics training, I still would pursue my passion for. Uh, rural medicine and in some parts my passion for anesthesia yet and probably pursue a path in uh, rural generalist training with a focus in anesthesia. I've already looked into what it takes to pursue that path in the sad instance that I don't get in but I think it is always important to have a plan B um, and that certainly would be the path I would consider if I was unsuccessful for anesthesia. Fantastic, I, I, I really like that answer because I think if you have a genuine plan B that is aligned with your uh, you know, with your story of you and what you value, it just all sounds congruent. You know, I'm, I'm looking for trainees who are reliable and honest and trustworthy and know what, what the next five, 10 years is going to look like for them. And right now you, I feel like you, you realize that and you've got a lot of things in motion uh, to get that sorted. So that, that's really good. Uh, okay. Well, that's a, uh, that, was, that was just a random, actually interesting. I was in, I was in Broome just a few weeks ago. Luckily I escaped lockdown in Melbourne and I said, oh, you know, I'd love to work here. Like, and I asked my mate, who's a GP and he says, can I, can I get a job here? And he goes, no, nah, I think you're too specialized. We need you to be able to work on awards and in ED. And I'm like, what? I got my fanska. I'm a specialist. And now you're telling me I can't work somewhere. <laughs> anyway, so there's a lot of advantages to not being a specialist, but that's aside from the point. Uh, I'll give you a situational question now. Um, yeah, tell, tell me a time that you were criticized for your performance at work. I have a moment to think about this question. Yeah. I just need to gather my thoughts. Um, I, th I think um, I know a time I have been criticised at work has been that um, feedback I've received is that I'm generally quite soft-spoken um, and that in times of certainly 
outside of times of crisis, this isn't necessarily an issue, but certainly in the operating theatre, this can become an issue, particularly when I need to start stepping up and leading crisis situations and start training for that. Um, I um, have received that feedback from a few different sources now, so I know that it is an issue that I need to work on. Um, I have asked for direct feedback in terms of um, how they would like me to speak and how they would like me to be, be more assertive in those crisis situations. And I've taken it upon myself to look up um, courses that develop um, non-clinical um, situational skills that focus on communication and leadership. Excellent. Uh, yeah, good. Um, do you have an approach for these kind of questions? So it sounded like you hadn't prepared for this for the when you criticize. Is that right? No. Okay. Good. Uh, first of all, I'd say leader, a situational experience of leadership, teamwork, or follow followership. Criticized, did extremely well. I kind of had this panel of situations that I could invoke. The, that those situations as, as an answer to when were you a leader? When were you a good team player? When were you when did you perform exceptionally well? When did when were you criticised? And I'll try to complete those scenarios. The fact that you hadn't prepared, not a big problem. You answered it, you answered it well, and it 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 didn't seem like a a work. I'm a I work too hard kind of, you know, cr crappy answer like that. So um, I was I was pretty happy with that answer. And now you've got one to go just in case you ask in in case you ask that. Is that a legitimate one? Because I I have been told I speak too softly. I don't know if that's just a. <laughs> You, you know, like I, I yeah, I, I think that's a that's a pretty genuine thing. And the fact that you've had a solution to it, I had this problem is so this is a situation or task. This is the action I took, and this is the result. And I speak better. So kind of like that star approach for situational questions, or the scar approach, which then we talked about: situation, complexity, action, result, and reflection. Uh, and what, and what yeah, sorry. Uh, situation, task, action, reflection. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so back in the back in the day, people used to ask, "What are your strengths?" People can li just list stuff, but if you ask the situation, then it's very hard to color a situation with a bunch of lies and, or you know or falsehoods. So, um, asking a situation is far more, you know, I guess, pr past behavior is reflective of future future performance, and so asking situational questions is a is a way just to just to see that maybe it's already stuff has already been sorted, actions have already been taken, and you're yeah. aware and insightful about those things. Can I just ask so yeah. I was trying to think how to deal with questions that throw me and that what I did then which was can I have a moment to gather my thoughts is the the yeah. only way I have of like being like oh my god <laughs> okay I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask you a question kind of after 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 Kaz actually you know, let's let's go straight to it yeah. <laughs> this this was a this was a pretty hard question that I've asked um in the past okay so when was the time that you've um uh halted your progress or sacrifice your progress for someone else's benefit? Uh, I think I've actually done this a few times now. Um, as anyone applying to ANSCA is, or any kind of anaesthetic training program, I should say, sorry, in Australia is aware the audit process is um, a huge part of that application and is, is well valued on any CV. Um, and I had, I was trying to get quite a few audits on my CV and I realized that the anesthetic department was only interested in a handful of audits at, at this particular moment in time. And there's a, a resident the year below me who was also very keen on anesthetics um, who, had not really built his CV up yet. And I knew that this would be a really great opportunity for him to build his CV at the expense of it going on my CV. But I do have an attitude now that, you know, while medical school, you know, was incredibly competitive to get into and quite competitive throughout it, I really think that the, the way forward throughout any specialty training program is actually working with your colleagues to get through those hard moments, whether it's building your CV, practicing for interviews or um, practicing for things like the primaries. And I'm pretty sure this, this particular person will get into ANSCA at some point, will probably be a colleague of mine and maybe we might even work together in a department sometime in the future. And I'd rather be remembered as that person who gave him some opportunities than someone who took them away. 
Yeah, fantastic. That, that, that was a great answer. I'm really happy that you had a, had a pretty solid answer for that because um, in my experience, that's that's been a very difficult answer for most people. And and the advice that I'm kind of thinking, this is obviously an exception on on the spot. I think you did really well with that with that answer. But there's some sometimes where people can literally not think of things to say, and 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 I'm getting the feeling now that sometimes it's completely okay to say to say, you know, honestly, I just, I just can't think of an instant. Can I have another question? Or you know, I think I've just been so driven or motivated that I don't think I've had, I've been very fortunate that I haven't had to sacrifice my own progress because there's been, you know, enough, enough of abundance of opportunities or, or, or whatever else I need to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, if that's the truth, that's fine. But I think you answered that question really well. So we'll go to the next one. Yeah, I was I was really impressed by that, L. Well done. Um, after yeah, I, I've asked this question a couple of times um, since we had the conversation a lot, and um, yeah, yeah, like people people find it really challenging. Um, I think that was I think that was fantastic. I have I have no comments about that answer. I think that was as good as I could have ever imagined someone saying it. So well done. Um, again, going back to kind of Lars' point, if you didn't have something to say. Another thing, another tactic you can use is good. Going, look, I'm, I'm I'm having some trouble thinking of a specific example, but I I often you know do think that we need to establish a culture where we are prepared to sacrifice things for our colleagues and for those around us. And ultimately, um, you know, if you can do something that that betters a, a large number of people or someone else at your own expense, that is something you should consider. And if we all did it a bit more, then the entire department and the profession would be you know, bettered and progressed. So you could say something like that, which still shows that you care, you get it, you understand the implications, you um, are kind of aligned with the philosophical ideals, um, but you're being honest and saying you can't think of an example, which I don't think anyone would hold against you. So that's another way where you can kind of sidestep if you are having a bit of a mind freeze. Yeah, which will happen. So thank you. <laughs> Inevitably. Um, and also don't be afraid to say, can I have a minute? Um, people are really terrified of, of doing this, but whenever anyone's asked for, can have you know, a few seconds to think about it, no one minds. Um, and it's so much better than you picking an unideal example because you're stressed or you stumbling over yourself and not giving a well-structured answer. I, I feel like if I took a minute, I still wouldn't be able to get the answer. If I don't get it in the first few seconds, it's, it's gone. <laughs> but that, that's just me. Um, excellent. Yeah, Kaz, do you want to give another one? Yeah. All right, Elle. Um, so... What do you know about the anesthetics training program? Sure. So the anesthetics training program is in total, it's five years. It's broken down into three core units, introductory training, basic training, advanced training, and then finally fellowship. Um, There are a number of assessments that must be passed and um, get gotten through in order to progress from one stage of core unit to the other. And it's all done in a spiral learning fashion. I can go into more detail than that if, if you would like. Yeah. Um, sure. So the assess the major assessments are your primary examination in order to progress from introductory training, uh, sorry, from basic training to advanced training. And in order to progress from advanced training to fellowship training, you need to pass your fellowship examinations. There actually, are- actually, to make it more, most relevant for you, what do you think you need to prepare for your, fi- for your primary examination? Like, what, what are the challenges you have to overcome? Sure. So um, the primary examination in discussion with my anaesthetic consultants and colleagues who are already on the program is hands down probably the most professional, uh, most challenging uh, experience I will have during the program. So I have actually spent quite some time thinking about how I will deal with this and get through it on the other side. Um, so I would break it down into managing my professional obligations, um, my work life Um, balance and personal obligations, as well as the very practical fundamentals of how to prepare for the exam. Um, So professional obligations would be ensuring that I have got some good basic knowledge of how to do an anaesthetic safely and know how to escalate concerns so that I can continue to maintain an adequate professional practice at work while balancing the commitments of study. Um, I think work-life balance is essential. I would break this down into making sure that I maintain contact with family and friends. I've got a good GP that looks after me, sleep well, eat well, meditate, do the things that I love when I can. For me, that's the ocean. Um, And then finally, some really practical things with study. Go find the people that passed, (laughs) get information from them about how they did it um, and pick their brains would be my, has been my starting point. Um, Find some other people around you to form a study group 
and then um, start gathering your resources. I'm actually really interested in um, the science of studying. So I, there's a lot of information about something called active recall, which has actually got a lot more evidence behind it than just reading something and then writing out notes. Uh, we sense. are all about active recall, aren't we, Kat? <laughs> you're, pitching, you're pitching to the choir here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that, uh, yeah, that that's just because yeah, I thought your answer was really great. So yeah, yeah. that was fantastic. No, that, that was excellent. Um, can I just say, um, I think things you do really well, you speak really well and you speak very articulately and, and it seems to come very naturally to you. So that's, or, or you may have worked on it. I'm not gonna make any assumptions, but you present very well. So um, I think your 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 baseline is excellent. Um, so that, that's really good. Um, you have a good manner, you have a really good pacing and your and your um, enunciation and your, um, your, your pace is really good. You don't feel rushed, even if you're stressed, like I can't tell. Um, if, you, if you're this way in a code, you know, you, you'll make a great anesthetics registrar. Um, <laughs> and, and, at, and at the risk of having lots of people try to just be L's now. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things about the, you know, the tone and it, it's not boring. It's not, it's not monotonous. Yeah, uh, just keep up with uh, what you're doing with that. That's fantastic. For anyone who's listening, I, I have been practicing. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that when I started, I think I sounded like a chipmunk. I was talking so fast and I would... I think one of the bosses, I think I talked at her for like 10 minutes practicing like my, what are my strengths question. Yeah. She was like, oh, that was so boring. And you never let me, <laughs> you were talking so fast, you didn't even let me interrupt you to stop you. Yeah. And so I purposely tried to slow myself down and give lots of gaps. So if I'm, and to give the, hopefully the interviewer an opportunity, if I'm like way off mark to be like, no, this is ask another question or guide me. And yeah. it, it's That's hard. It's not in my nature to talk this slowly. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, not, none of this stuff comes easy, right? Like selling yourself to people across a Zoom screen, a panel of people who are essentially in charge of the opportunity for you to progress in your career. It's mm. damn intimidating. And um, yeah, all of this stuff takes practice. So I think that's a good, yeah, just a really good uh, vote for practice. Mm. Um, sh sorry, you go, Kaz. Uh, no, I was going to ask, I'm curious just... Um, because uh, Lai and I have been talking a little bit about kind of how long people prepare for and kind of what's normal and how much variation there is. Would you mind sharing how long you've kind of been practicing interviews for or at least thinking about it? I think I started, I knew, so the interview I'm sitting is in Tuesday week. Hmm. Um, and I had sort of mentally wanted to start five weeks before, but it wasn't like every day. It was just on the weekends. I actually sort of started watching your videos mm -hmm a lot and listening to those podcasts on the drive to work. And I just counted that as study. And then I happen to be in a department that's incredibly supportive and have allowed us all the regs time to practice with each other. Okay. Um, and the bosses will randomly question us during um, cases. And it's, it's been a really supportive environment in that sense. That's awesome. Excellent. Well done. Uh, I might move on to a clinical question now. Okay. Let's say you've got a, let's say you've got a 50 year old, male post a lap collie. Yep. Uh, maybe it's day one post-op and you're the anesthetic, say you're the anesthetic HMO reg on for the day. Yep. Uh, and you're called because the patient, uh, the nurse is quite worried on the ward. The patient has a tachycardia of 150. Mm -hmm. Yeah, tell me how you approach this. Okay. Um, so first of all, obviously this is a, a clinical scenario that has the potential to escalate into something really serious particularly if a nurse has called it because they're concerned, that always makes me concerned. That would be my, my first statement. I would attend the patient immediately and attend the bedside. Um, I would ensure that there was a basic set of vitals done, end of bedogram, is this an emergency crisis that a met call needs to be initiated or not? In terms of assessment from that point on, always my A to E approach. Um, would you like me to go into more details about my A to E approach? Yeah, let's, let's say you do it and, um, uh, and, and let's say the patient is tachycardic at 150 as, uh, as per the SATS probe uh, and the blood pressure is at 90 on 60 uh, okay. and all the other observations, the rest rate is mildly elevated at 28, all the other obs are normal. And he's got a GCS 15 and 12. Yeah, GCS 15. Okay. Um, so this is potentially concerning. There's two parameters that I'm very concerned about basically hemodynamic instability <laughs> setting of a tachycardia or an arrhythmia. Um, my first thing that I would do is recheck all those um, vitals and make sure that they were accurate readings. Yes. Uh, and then I would start to manage this 
probably more so from a shock management point of view. So I categorize shock into four components that helps me think about them. So cardiogenic, um, uh, whether it's um, obstructive, cardiogenic, um, or if it's something like a sepsis um, process. Uh, and the ways in which I would assess each of those would then contribute to my management plan. So, you know, I would um, assess the patient, take a history either from the patient or collateral from the nurse that's there. Um, I would um, do a physical examination and order any relevant investigations and then develop a management plan. I should add that at each point in time, I would, um, we are constantly revisiting whether I need to escalate this to a senior or ask for help. Fantastic. So first of all, um, the, the approach you said was really good. Now I'll give us a few, a few specifics. You mentioned the keywords of, you know, you're concerned, you attend A2E assessment, fantastic. And you said escalate at the very end. If you hadn't said that, I would have said, even though you say A2E assessment and that and calling for help is part of that, uh, that's great that you volunteered it. Maybe even doing it at the start is fine. Uh, I like that you asked for the vitals, you rechecked them, and then you had a structured. So you, you chose to structure it as a shock. And, you know, one of those things that you probably know is you said four types of shock, and then you mentioned three, uh, but that's, that's completely fine. You didn't, you weren't, you know, <laughs> hyperbolemic cardiogenic. That's right. And sepsis is distributed. And, and that's not a problem though, because you didn't get stuck on that. Like, you know, no one's going to go, Hey, you said four, <laughs> and you only said, you know, three, that, uh, that wasn't a problem for me. And that's you know, completely fine. I like that you had that approach. You also had a very good approach for that because you said, is this a tachycardia or arrhythmia? So in my mind, I was thinking, I was just going to uh, make it a rapid AF. It's, you know, with every tachycardia, you want the ECG strip and then you diagnose it, but you mentioned those things. And so I would, I would have volunteered AF and then we can go down that arrhythmia management. Uh, but yes, I was very happy with that framework. And then, you know, this isn't a viva, this is not me trying to grill you on the, es the essence of that, but it shows that you have managed this. And I, I expect that your time being an ICU reg and, and doing this stuff uh, means that you're, you're pretty all over this. So I'm, I was very happy with your structure because the structure, let's say it's just, you know, junior HMOs that are getting this question. We just don't expect you to be all over, you know, the, the, you know, can, the register advanced register level of managing this, but you have a framework that I can, I, I can, you know, I can reward you for, I, I, I I'm, I'm very, I'm very re rewarding in the framework, in, even in the lack of some knowledge that junior HMOs might not have. Mm -hmm. cool. And I think what you did well was you, you were quite dynamic in your structure as well. So you obviously started off a certain way. And I think you were really mindful that you didn't want to go down the wrong path. So you said, do you want me to elaborate on that? And Lau was like, no, don't care. I know you can spell. Let's go into what specifically um, he wanted you to cover. So I, th I thought, thought that was quite a good tactic because a lot of people do then start going down tangents in this question. And it really depends on the interview as to whether they'll pull you back or that they'll just... So I used to do that before I listened to your channel. Uh, I used to get... And it, it would frustrate me because whenever you're only given two sentences and then you're making up an A to E algorithm with no information, like it, it's very... So, uh, relates to whatever's actually in front of you. Yeah. Yes. Like, oh, I can just say I do A to E. Yeah. And then move on. <laughs> That's right. And 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 to be honest, if if a person says that, and you know, uh, like I teach this in the part two exam courses, where I'll say, look, you know, I'm not. If I think you've got the A to E assessment, I'm not going to you know, I'm going to look for the point of difference of this case. I'm going to examine you on that part of it. But sometimes I'll go, yeah, tell me about the ADU assessment. So you can never really gambit on, you have to know the ADU assessment. Uh, and, and so you can't say it fluidly in 20 seconds of quick, you know, quick words, then that's, that's also a problem, but that's, that's something for later. So this was definitely not that situation. I need to test you on ADUE. Yeah, cool. Good job. All right. Um, next question, L. Um, so you are in your first year of anesthetics training, congrats. Mm -hmm. You are doing a cover job um, and uh, you're finishing off a long craniotomy. And while you're um, waiting for the surgeon to finish, you notice that you doze off um, and fall asleep. And it's been about 10 minutes since you fell asleep on the chair. Uh, you wake up. I want you to think about what are the main issues here and what would you do? Mm -hmm. um, so... The first issue here is patient safety. So I have fallen asleep for what sounds like 10 minutes of the case. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And um, am I the only anesthetic person in that room? So this Correct. is quite serious. Um, 
because patient safety has been compromised and I'm clearly so fatigued, I don't think it would be appropriate me to start even managing that patient. If there was a compromise, I would immediately call for help and notify my seniors about what has just happened and give uh, ISPA a handover, including the fact that this patient has been unattended by uh, an anaesthetic trainee myself for the last 10 minutes. Um, and hopefully this patient will then receive the appropriate care and any incidents um, would be debriefed with the patient afterwards. I guess the second thing would then relate to, to me personally. So I have an acronym for my red flags when I know that I'm too stressed and that's HALT, hungry, angry, late and tired. This really falls well within that domain of being tired. Um, certainly if I'm falling asleep at work, there's something significant has happened, whether it's sleep debt from too many night shifts or there's something stressful going on at home. Um, I would talk to a trusted mentor at work about what's happened and seek any advice about where to go to from, from there. I would talk to trusted colleagues and friends, um, potentially my welfare officer as well, um, in terms of sort of my professional uh, liaising that I should do to seek support. But also I think obviously talk to my partner, talk to family and friends about what's happening, go see my GP. There's, there's lots of helplines that we can access, but I think a very thorough um, personal reflection on what's actually brought me to the point where I'm falling asleep in the middle of the case. And, you know, I think the worst outcome would if something happened to that patient, just how terrible I, I would feel. Um, yeah, I would, I would want to do everything I could to avoid ever having that happen to me again or a patient. What are some wider um, institutional or cultural um, issues that might be relevant in this sort of situation? Um, well, fatigue management is a big thing. And this is an issue that faces every specialty in medicine and is not specific to anaesthetics. And it's actually something I'm quite passionate about because I... I you see things how pilots run their fatigue. They have very strict time on, time off. They recognize that fatigue kills. And yet this is not something that is taught in medical school. And it's certainly not part of our culture as we train through internship and residency. And I guess I've always had the attitude it doesn't matter how brilliant you are. If you haven't slept for 72 hours, you will make a mistake. Um, I think personally, I think medicine still has a long way to go to ensure that we have a safe workplace culture where fatigue doesn't arise as frequently as it does. I would add, I think anesthesia does do an excellent job with fatigue management. Um, certainly uh, in the current workplace I'm in, if we ever do an on-call, we always have a sort of an RDO the day afterwards and there's an opportunity to recover from that fatigue. Um, but I, I think that there is a lot of work to be done in that area. Great. How do you think you went on that one? I don't know. I was trying not to slag off other specialties. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, the surgeons, the surgeons yeah. sleep for 72 hours. <laughs> um, there's, there's a really interesting document uh, in one of our welfare. I'm pretty sure it's one of our welfare documents on fat fatigue saying, have you, have you heard of the number? If you're awake for 17 hours straight, you're, it's the equivalent of blood alcohol of 0.05. Awake yeah, for 24 I hours, 0.1. I yeah. haven't read that document, but I, I do know. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. Twelve hours or something. Pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you did did really well. Um, so, um, it, it, that was kind of a I made that intentionally vague because I wanted you. So, so th there there is an element of this where you want to give someone a vague question to see whether they get confused because you can make this more complicated by getting really bogged down on the case and whether up to is there bleeding blah blah blah. I think you were excellent and you, you clarified two salient points that would help you structure a scenario that you could answer and patient safety number one fantastic that was really good um your self-management stuff was phenomenal um the way you structured those things immediately made me go great you know if Elle's ever tired or in danger of doing anything she will have the insight and the resources and the capability to know when to ask for help and will um be really appropriate in the kind of structure she puts into place so that's you told me a lot about yourself by just answering that question um, I think that was kind of a near perfect answer. Um, I've kind of pushed you on the societal structural stuff. So whenever they ask you, what are the issues? One of the things I like to do is I, I call it like the reverse looking glass. I just made it up. Um, essentially you kind of start from the patient, then you go to you, then you go to the people around you, then you go to the profession as a whole. And then if you want to wider society. 
So patient safety, personal safety, um, its impact on your other colleagues. So, you know, you might have had a resident who saw you fall asleep and it made them really uncomfortable. You might have had a medical student who's, who saw you fall asleep. Um, you're compromising the surgeon's ability to do their job safely because you're not able to do yours. Um, and then the the, the um, college um, specialty level stuff. So, um, you know, safe hours, um, adequate ro- rostering, safe rostering, adequate hiring. So people aren't doing extra hours. So mm-hmm. those are kind of some of the issues. Um, and then wider society. So the EBA, um, advocacy, um, you know, you could even talk about kind of mental health and suicide rates in junior doctors. You could bring all these elements in. So that next level, which shows that you have a wider picture, really, um, I think, cast yourself as like the advocate within your specialty, which then kind of really elevates you to the next level. And that's kind of what I was pushing you to do. They, they wouldn't do that in an interview. I think most of the interviews I've had, they kind of asked the question and they let you just do it. Um, La and I are kind of pushing you to prove a point, essentially, in some of these questions. And what about, so I expressed a pretty personal opinion that certainly might not be held by everyone. How often should you do that? Which opinion was that, Elle? Well, that fatigue management and that, that we have so much more to improve. There might be someone who thinks that we've got, um, in front of me that's interviewing me, thinks we've got excellent fatigue management policies in place. I'm, yeah, I, I don't think it's controversial, but yeah, I think you can just phrase it in a certain way. I, th- I think we can always do better in fatigue management or fatigue management is a thing that we've been working on for a long time. Something okay. like that, because you, you never have to point the finger at anything if you sure. just say working on it. And you can say you're adapting to like, new evidence because there is a lot more research now than there was 30 40 years ago and um you know we are behind the aviation industry but a lot's being done to change it um uh and, and you can kind of mention that and you can mention the complexities like why can't we function like the aviation industry because we aren't private entities you know we don't have the resources or the staffing um or the ability to just to not to fly a plane because you're tired you know like you can't not do a decompressive cranny because your anesthetist is tired do, the patient needs to, mm. to be done so if you if you address those complexities kind of shows that you're then thinking about it and you understand why it's so slow to take up mm. but you can also appreciate that a lot's being done um mm. i'll be slowly yeah okay let's ask you a bit of a random question um l how many coffees are drunk in australia every every day sorry every year i would suspect a lot um, I can give you an answer as to how I would sort of try and figure out the exact number. Um, I think there must be some centralised import database, exactly how many coffee beans are brought into Australia every day. I would try and find that. I would figure out how many coffee beans go into a cup of coffee and I would, well, I guess I just know how much coffee beans have turned up in the country that would give me a sense of how many coffees are in any given bag. And then I could just kind of go from there. Yeah. Good. Um, I remember one of my corporate mates asking a question like this is to do with how many white cars are sold in Australia or exist in Australia every year. And I, I just started off by saying, okay, there's, you know, five major colors, this many, you know, people in Australia. And, and as I just started talking through a process, he said, yep, good done. Just, I just want to see that you're not overwhelmed by something that has a process to it. And yep. You sounded like you had a pretty reasonable approach to it. So uh, you know, I, 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 I'm only saying this because some people have been asking, asking these corporate style questions in medicine and you might as well hear about it and be, be have an approach. Um, have you, have you been asked that before or something along the lines of that? The abstract type stuff? No. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. I, I think it's just proving a point that if you have a process, it, it sounds reasonable, that whatever you say, as long as you're in the ballpark of a figure or an approach that seems right, then it's showing that you have an you know, intellectual process to explore the hypothetical situations. And I, and I do value that. Like I personally do value that. I think it's a marker of intelligence to not ha- need to have concrete ideas uh, before you can ex- explore things like to be able to explore these hypotheticals in any area, I think really helps us in medicine um, as well as yeah, many other areas as well. Yeah. And I think I also think about other ways you could go about it. So that was, a, that was like a great answer. Um, but I think with any of these, you can think of multiple ways to address it. So another way you could go is, you know, if you assume approximately 60% of all Australians drink coffee, um, there's, I don't even know what Australia's population is. Um, then you <laughs> so work 20, 25 out, million, 26 million, 26 million. So then you work out, you know, I don't know, maybe 50% drink more than one a day, 50% drink one. That's an <laughs> estimate. That's another way to do it. So we've probably been going for around 45 minutes and it's obviously much longer than any interview would be now because look, I honestly think you're doing, doing really well. I was thinking of just giving you a few quick fire questions 
questions uh, where you, and this is definitely not something that happens in an interview, but because you've got approaches to lots of things that are useful, uh, I thought we would recap some of these things. So approach to a sick patient is what? Uh, attend immediately, escalate, um, A to E approach. Fantastic. Assessment of any problem is, or any um, patient presents with something, assessment of a well patient is? Uh, it's um, history, examination, investigations, and then a uh, management Fantastic. Plan. Oh, yeah. uh, fantastic. Manage all management plans are? Run past the boss. Yep, and if you were to approach it in a broad framework, how would you manage anything? This might be a bit more vague, so you just tell me what you think. In in accordance with guidelines? Yep, potentially, yep, guidelines. And then if the guidelines were to divide up into st styles of management, what do you reckon it would be? Pharmacological, non-pharmacological. Be beautiful. Farm, okay. non-farm, interventional, okay. et cetera, et cetera, surgical, medical. Yep. You can do that. Um, uh, uh, graded assertiveness pace Fantastic. Pro, um oh god i forgot the a um chal uh, challenge and then uh, escalate yeah a is alert or assess yeah um but yep challenge emergency or escalate fantastic uh, uh incident a critical incident happens at work uh the, the three d's which you taught me oh, yep. um so you're going to debrief and you're going to um, discuss with the consultant and the department, which can take the form of M&Ms um, and risk mans and other uh, styles of um, mm -hmm. discussion with the department and the consultant. And then finally to debrief with the team involved. And one more thing, I think you said debrief at the start, which is right. Uh, and then you said- oh, open uh, disclosure, I missed the three okay. Ds. Fantastic. So, sorry, open disclosure, yeah. uh, discuss the department and the consultant and then debrief. In the discussion part, there's a few more steps of where you would enter this information into. What are those things? Um, like electronic records. Mm -hmm. Is that, yep, M&Ms, yep. um, root cause analyses. We have something called risk man, which is the- um, Same. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a uh, Australia-wide system for anesthesia called uh, WebAirs or any, okay. any kind of anesthesia incident monitoring scheme. And at that same point, you then have to call maybe your medical indemnity as well. Right. Yep. But that's good. Three days. I like that. Kaz taught, taught me that as well. <laughs> I think that was a good framework. And then one of those Ds definitely goes into far more detail. I think that's good for a rapid fire question. And look, that's yeah, probably well that's probably uh, giving you enough grilling for now. So, yeah. Um. Did you did you have any questions or anything else to add? Um. No, that's been really good. Thank you so much. Um. I really appreciate your podcast. I actually wanted to tell you how I found out about your show. Oh, yeah? In a very dark moment, like a month or two into my anesthetic training, and I was losing my mind because I couldn't get, I was missing all these tubes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, right, I'm spending all weekend just studying anatomy. And like, I, even with feedback from bosses, I just, something wasn't right. And I, mm -hmm. I'm embarrassed, but I typed into Google and YouTube how to intubate. And <laughs> we've, all, we've all done that. <laughs> <laughs> video came up and I was like, oh, okay. And I started watching it. You just explained it. It's so I've since been able to get tubes since watching that video. So thank you so much. It's been wonderful to actually. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's like the best compliment ever. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Like the side technique where you actually tube from the side so I could keep watching. That was yeah. me a lot. Awesome. Oh, so, so happy to hear. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Anyway, it's definitely better than the, some of the trolls that I've gotten. So yeah, amazing. <laughs> oh, there's, there's lots of experts of things that have very strong opinions on. Uh... Oh, uh, no, I've, I've been getting tubes now, so I'm happy. No, that's good. Yeah. Um, cool. We might, we, we might sign off there then, Kaz. Go for it. Yeah, yeah awesome. Well, well done, Al. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so this was uh, part seven, I think, of um, interview training. So thanks, Al, for coming and joining and doing some interview practice. Hopefully you guys all found that useful. Um, if you're interested, again, feel free to email us and we can do kind of a similar session. And if you have any ideas for any episodes or um, things you would like us to discuss, please email us at anesthesiapodcast at gmail.com. Otherwise, um, yeah, please rate and tell your friends and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye.